Hey, what's up? Most of the time, jelly donuts are way more about the jelly than they are the donut. This is a mistake. There's way too much jelly in those things and that jelly is way too sweet. So today I'm gonna show you how to make a light flavorful donut and then how to stuff it with the proper amount of a pleasantly sweet but balanced homemade jam. To get started, I'll grab my stand mixer and into the bowl of that combined 340 grams of scalded whole milk. And when I say scalded, I mean heated to just about 180F and then cooled down to about 90F. This heating step denatures proteins inside of the milk that would otherwise inhibit gluten formation. Next in is 10 grams of instant yeast, two large eggs, 100 grams of sugar, 100 grams of melted but not hot butter, then 685 grams of strong all-purpose flour and eight grams of salt. Next, the dough hook goes on and I'll mix this dough for nine minutes in total. The first three of which will be at low speed. And after three minutes or so, this mess should have consolidated into something that can be called dough. And from here, this mixer is gonna go up to high speed and I'll mix it for at least six more minutes. This dough has a lot of added fat and sugar, also known as enrichment, and that makes developing gluten much harder to do. So we need to give this dough quite a bit more mixing than we would if it was just flour, water, salt, and yeast. And if you're wondering, hey, Bri, can I do this mix by hand? No. This dough is way too sticky and just won't come together without a good long mix from a mechanical stand mixer. Sorry guys. And after six minutes of high speed mixing, this dough has moved from a sticky mass into a clean ball that's clearing the bowl. Of course, to check if it's mixed all the way, I'll give it a firm tug to see if it tears or shears, and it does not, so it's good to go. Next, I'll flip this into a bowl, and then I'll come back and round this dough into a nice tidy ball. I'm stretching and tucking this as I round it to create some additional tension that's gonna help add even more structure to the gluten network. And there we go, nice and tight. From here, I'll pop on a lid and ferment this dough at room temp for 60 minutes. In the meantime, let's make some jelly. For that, I'll grab a heavy bottom pot and into it combine 500 grams of raspberries, blue, black, or strawberries would also work well with this recipe, by the way, then 700 grams of sugar, 20 grams of lemon juice, and 20 grams of white distilled vinegar. Next, I'll move this pot over to the stove and drop it on medium-high heat. I'm gonna get the sugar heated up until it's fully dissolved, and then I'll bring everything up to a spirited simmer and cook it for about 10 minutes. I want to cook the raspberries to the point that they've lost their liquid and they're almost fully softened. And after 10 minutes of cooking and stirring pretty often, I'll check back to see how the fruit is looking. And as you can see, it smushes pretty easily on the side of the pot, so we're ready to move on. From here, I'm gonna strain out some of the excessive raspberry seeds. To do that, I got a little fine mesh strainer here, and I'm gonna scoop out about half of the cooked fruit to pass through it. Some seeds are good, but the amount that nature decided raspberry needed is way too much for human pleasure in the context of a jelly donut. I don't wanna crunch on too many seeds when I'm enjoying my tender, fluffy dough. Once I got about half in the strainer, I'll come back and push the cooked fruit through until there are only seeds left behind. Also, make sure to diligently scrape up any of the raspberry pulp that's left on the outside of the strainer. That's the most flavorful bit by far, and it would be a shame to leave it behind. And once I've got about 50% less seeds in this mixture, I'm going to move this pot over to the stove one more time. This stuff's hot, so it's going to simmer again right away. And once it's bubbling like this, I'll add in 60 grams of regular fruit pectin. Then I'll whisk that right away to get it fully dissolved with the fruit. Pectin needs a combination of temperature, acidity, and sugar concentration to reach its full thickening potential. So once this is dissolved, we need to cook it down until it reaches 220 degrees Fahrenheit. That'll only take about two minutes or so. If you don't hit this temp, your jam will be runny. And once we're at 220F, it's time to move this jam over to a heat tolerant vessel so that we can cool it down. On second thought, I'm actually gonna spread this jam out between two bowls so that it can set faster. I'll move these bowls over to the fridge to chill for about 90 minutes and then check back on my donut dough. It's been about 60 minutes at this point and you can see the dough has risen by about 30 to 40%, so now it's time to shape. But first, let me quickly thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Magic Spoon makes cereals that taste just as good as the junky stuff that we all grew up eating, but with higher quality ingredients, natural flavors, and check this out, zero grams of sugar. How is that even possible? Magic Spoon also has 13 to 14 grams of protein and only four to five net carbs per serving. I've actually been very impatiently waiting to film this ad so that I could open and eat all of the boxes that I got in my most recent order. My bundle this month included honey nut, maple, waffle, fruity, and cinnamon roll. And if you wanna build your own bundle, just click the link below and for a limited time to celebrate Magic Spoon's birthday in April, you'll get a free box of my all-time favorite flavor, birthday cake with any order. Just use my 
my link in the description to be sure the free box is added to your cart. Magic Spoon is backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money but I'm pretty sure you're gonna like it. Again, go to magicspoon.com slash Brian B Day to get a free box of birthday cake cereal with your order. To shape these donuts, I'll flour my cutting board, I'll flip out my dough, I'll flour the backside, and then using a flat hand or a rolling pin, I'll degas the dough. This keeps the small bubbles inside the dough, but pushes out all the big ones. Those lead to bubble gum sized bubbles later on that can ruin the donuts once they're in the fryer. And once I've got this flattened out, I'll start to roll it out. Because of the weird way that I'm gonna be cutting these donuts in just a second, I'm looking to get this rolled into a roughly square in shape. In my opinion, the best way to do that is to give the corners a little tug as you roll it out to get the dough stretched in that direction. But I'll also give the dough some extra rolls from corner to corner to get some more diagonal pressure pushing it out into a square. And once I've got this rolled into a rough square, that's in the ballpark of 11 inches across like this. I'll take my dough scraper and cut the edges off to create an evenly flat square that's just about nine inches on each side. From there, I'll cut the larger square into nine three by three inch pieces. I know what you're thinking, square donuts, bro? Yes, these are easier to cut than round ones and create a lot less scrap. Of course, if you're stuck on the traditional round shape, you could just use a ring mold or a floured glass to pop them out, but it's likely that you'll only get eight donuts out of the dough that way, and you'll get double the scrap. Next, I'll move these donuts over to a parchment lined sheet tray to proof for about 60 to 70 minutes. I'll set a timer and I'll check back then. One hour later, these donuts have just about doubled in size and are proofed perfectly. See how that indent pops back ever so gently when I poke it? That's how I know how. Next, I'll drop a pot on the stove and load it with 40 ounces or about 1200 grams of canola oil. And once that oil is at 340 degrees Fahrenheit, it's time to fry. I prefer to cook these donuts three at a time in three different batches. This gives them all the room that they need to grow in the pot so they don't get stuck together. Halfway through or after 90 seconds, I'll come back and check on the oil side to see how the browning is progressing. And these are looking golden, but not dark. So I'll flip them over and fry them on the backside for 90 more seconds. Also, I don't know why these developed that little light spot on the side that was touching the sheet tray during proofing, but it makes no impact on the eating experience later on. And after another 90 seconds of fry time on the backside, I'll come back and confirm that these donuts are golden all all over and they're looking good. So I'll move them over to a wire rack to drain them off and then I'll drop the next three. And once I've got all nine of these beautiful, fluffy, golden square donuts on the wire rack, I'm gonna pour a liberal amount of granulated sugar onto a plate so that I can give them that signature sparkly crunch on the outside. In my opinion, by far the best time to do this is when the donuts are still warm. That residual heat very gently melts the sugar, making it much stickier. And once I've got side one dusted up, I'll carefully flip this and then press side two into the sugar until I've got an even but not excessive coating on both sides. Next, let's jam these effers up with some jam. That raspberry jam that we made earlier has had about 90 minutes in the fridge to set. And as you can see, it's got a nice grippy texture to it now. If this stuff is too thick, it'll be sticky in your mouth and will take away from the soft fluffy donut. And if it's too thin, well, you've got a soggy, sloppy donut. Now, the best way that I found to fill these things is with a standard issue pastry piping bag. Link to these ones in the description if you're interested, but I'll also show you an alternative to these in just a second. The first step to filling these is to make an indent with a narrow blunt object in the side. I'm using the back end of a wooden spoon here and I'll push it all the way to the far side of the donut and then wiggle it back and forth to help open up a cavity so that the jelly can spread out a little bit more evenly. From there, I'll take my piping bag and squirt a bunch of jam in there. About three tablespoons is what I prefer. Any more than that, and there won't be enough rich fried donut in each bite to cut through the jam's acidity. And there we go. I'll clean up the ooziness here, and then I'll fill the other eight. And I'll mention that if you don't have a piping bag, a turkey baster can work. It's just that you'll need to refill the baster for each donut. And that's not only meticulous, but can be very messy. Anyways, that's how you make a slamming square jelly donut at home. The donut itself is exactly what you want. Mm. It's very light, a touch chewy, it's rich from all the butter inside, and it's got a nice yeasty flavor. The jam inside is subtly sweet, it's tart, it's bursting with dark berry flavor, and it's way better than the sugar bomb fruit gel that most donut shops use. This donut is a great way to treat someone you love, and I really, really hope you try it soon. Let's eat this thing! 
you guys love donut content, then I'm sure that you're also gonna love this video about cream cheese danishes. Check it out here.